Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to today's service. Let us begin. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, for as much as without you we're not able to please you, mercifully rule and direct our hearts in this service and in all things. Through Christ our Lord we pray. Amen. Amen. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be God's kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. The collect for the day, proper 14. Together. Grant to us, Lord, we pray, the spirit to think and do always those things that are right, that we who cannot exist without you may by you be enabled to live according to your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from Genesis. Jacob settled in the land where his father had lived as an alien, the land of Canaan. This is the story of the family of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was shepherding the flock with his brothers. He was a helper to the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives, and Joseph brought a bad report of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any other of his children because he was the son of his old age, and he had made him a long robe with sleeves. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peaceably to him. Now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem, and Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. He answered, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring word back to me. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron. He came to Shechem, and a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where they are pasturing the flock. The man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. They saw him from a distance, and before he came near to them, they conspired to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes this dreamer. Come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we shall say that a wild animal has devoured him, and we shall see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he delivered him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. Reuben said to them, Shed no blood. Throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, <clears throat> but lay no hand on him, that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the long robe with sleeves that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty, and there was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels carrying gum, balm, and rosin, on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and lay not lay our hands on him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. And his brothers agreed. When some Midianite traders passed by, they drew Joseph up, lifting him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> A reading from Psalm 105. Give thanks to the Lord and call upon his name. Make known his deeds among the peoples. 
sing to him, sing praises to him, and speak of all his marvelous works. Glory in his holy name, let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Search for the Lord in his strength, continually seek his face. Remember the marvels he has done, his wonders and the judgments of his mouth. O offspring of Abraham his servant, O children of Jacob his chosen. Then he called for a famine in the land and destroyed the supply of bread. He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. They bruised his feet in fetters, his neck they put in an iron collar. Until his prediction came to pass, the word of the Lord tested him. The king sent and released him, the ruler of the peoples set him free. He set him as a master over his household, as a ruler over all his possessions, to instruct his princes according to his will, and to teach his wisdom. Alleluia! Glory to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. <coughs> and after he dismissed the crowds, he went up the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat battered by the waves was far from the land, for the wind was against them. And early in the morning, he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to your God, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. Amen. Have you ever read a great novel? Sure you all have. Well, the first reading this morning makes has all the makings of a best-selling novel. Almost 14 chapters, beginning with the chapter today in the book of Genesis, is dedicated to one person, Joseph. Did you know that? 14 chapters. And what a drama it is. We see character development and mood swings and the plot deepens and thickens with each chapter. It is a gripping tale of rags to riches, nasty sibling rivalry. Anybody know about that? Love and hate, jealousy and rage, sex and violence, ambition and glory, treachery and deception, desperate circumstances, murderous intent, and betrayal and forgiveness. Almost sounds like my other job. No, this is not Fifty Shades of Gray or Black or Blue. This is the Bible, and it is real. We're not meant to miss, dear friends, the gritty and at times horrid reality of human behavior and life embedded in Joseph's story. In his story, we see aspects of humanity at our worst and at our best. Of course, at times, we see aspects of ourselves. But as much as we see the reality of human nature, this is really a narrative about God. In 5020, we would hear those heart-wrenching words. What you meant for evil, God meant for good. 
Ultimately, Joseph's story is a story about God, and that's important to us today. Joseph, the object of hate, despised, and rejected by his brothers, later becomes the agent of salvation. It echoes the story of Jesus. Do you hear that? Rejected and despised, saves those who despises him. But Joseph's story really explains how God's people ended up in Egypt and ultimately how God made a great nation of Israel. The book ends with these words, in Egypt. And so it tells us something significant about God's people in Egypt, right? What does it say? God's plan is shatterproof. God is to be trusted no matter what life throws at us. No matter what storms arise, no matter what pit we are thrown into, God is to be trusted. God is providential. God works in and through human power, but also against human power, as Walter Brueggemann puts it. It is also a message that we receive in the gospel reading today, not the one that Chid marked and I read incorrectly. No, I marked it incorrectly. But the correct one. Storms will blow up in our lives. But God has not left us alone. Storms will blow up in our lives. But God has not left us alone. The one who calms the storms and makes the wind to cease is always with us. He's always in control. And so as we face uncertainty in our lives right now, and I don't know what uncertainty there may be. Children, whether or not you're going to go back to school, whether or not you're going to have a job, some sort of health issue. I don't know what the uncertainty is. But this is the truth we need to hold on to. That God never abandons us. Yes, it's hard sometimes to trust God's plan, especially if we don't know it, especially if we can't see the way forward. It's hard to trust when life goes awry. So how do you respond when storms arise, when you're thrown into the pit, when there's division in the family, when there's dysfunction in your life? when your children don't get along, or you're fighting with your siblings? How do you respond when others deceive you? When you find yourself in desperate circumstances? Is there a Joseph in the house this morning? Are there some of Joseph's brothers here this morning? A little bum, slightly jealous, because others' lives seem to be going better? Others never seem to have some of the issues that we have. Is there a Reuben in the house this morning whose conscience is getting to him despite his anger toward his brother? Is there a Peter in the house this morning who in the midst of the storm takes his eyes off of Jesus? Who in the midst of dysfunction trusts in his own ability and is thinking instead of relying on God to work the plan out? Is there a Peter in the house this morning who breaks community with others by getting outside of the boat, who is living in isolation, who is burying in pain and the waters are covering them and they have no connection with others? Is there a Peter in the house today? As we ponder these questions and as we face the current pandemic as we face life's issues in general as we experience difficulty and dysfunction in life i'd like for us to focus on one theme this morning it is this god's absence how do you cope when god seems absent when the church doors are closed and you're not a part of the community, when you feel like you are in it all by yourself, how do you respond? In fact, have you ever had that problem of God's apparent absence? Perhaps we all have, right? 
So, dear friends, as we contemplate God's absence and silence at times, perhaps the first thing I want you to be aware of is this. Don't be surprised if there are dark periods in your life when you can't sense the radiance of God's love. When God doesn't seem close, when the touch of God's hand just doesn't seem to be there, don't be surprised. There are times that God seems silent. Sometimes that's part of God's plan. In the gospel reading, Jesus seems to be a ghost. Do you notice that? And in Genesis 37, God's name or presence is not mentioned once. Joseph is mentioned over 12 times, but God's name or presence is not mentioned once when his brothers are manhandling him. Where is God in all of this? Why isn't God mentioned? Everything seems to be in human hands. Everybody seems to be doing exactly what they want. Doesn't that seem like life sometimes? People seem to be getting away with things. People seem to be doing things and there's no justice. You work hard on the job, but someone else gets the promotion. You go and you labor all your life, but you only earn minimum salary and others who do nothing because of favoritism and nepotism get the big salaries. Where is God in all of this? The reality is, there are long periods when God's presence is not felt. When God seems miles away and we long for him to do something. In highlighting the fact that we shouldn't be surprised, I'd like us to be aware. Don't let the silence cause you to doubt God. Don't let the continuing dysfunction cause you to doubt God. God's silence is real and it is painful, but it is not to be equated with God's abandonment of us. And that's why Jesus chides Peter in the gospel reading today. He doesn't chide him for being afraid. You're going to feel some fear when you're facing threats and ill in life. You're going to feel pain when your family is in dysfunction. You're going to feel a lot of things when life isn't going smooth. That's to be expecting. Feelings are neither right nor wrong. They just show up because they're there. What Jesus does is he chides Peter for getting out of the boat and doubting God, for breaking fellowship with the community. Notice that even when Jesus declared, do not be afraid, it is I. Jesus showed him his hand. Peter replies, Lord, if it is you, let me come to you. Anyone else here knows where that same phrase is found in the Bible? Anywhere else? If it is you. Right? Remember the temptations? If you are the Son of God, command these stones. If you are, and then on the cross, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In other words, you can't really be the Son of God. And how often when God seems absent or silent, when life is going crazy, when dysfunction arises, we doubt God, even though he's shown us his hand. And so what this story does, both of these stories, is remind us how we respond. We doubt. We take our eyes off of Jesus. How has this recent pandemic caused you to take your eyes off of Jesus? How has the dysfunction in your life caused you to take your eyes off of Jesus? We doubt, we take our eyes off Jesus, we get out of the boat and we break community, we live in isolation, we try to take matters into our own hands, we trust our own powers and we focus on the wrong thing. A lot of times when people ask me to help them, I realize that they're focusing on the wrong thing. They come to me wanting me, John, to help them fix their wife. They come to me helping me, wanting me to help them fix their children. But it's never about helping them. 
we focus on the wrong things a lot of times when we're in dysfunction. He needs to do better. Luke, how many times have you told your mom, Hannah needs to stop as opposed to you being the big brother? Sydney and Sam, sounds familiar? We focus on everyone else except ourselves. But that's what happens when we are in the midst of dysfunction. And we highlight this not because we want to be chided, no, or God is chiding us, but rather he's inviting us to pay attention to how we respond so that we can address them and correct them. The perception is God is absent. The reality is God is present, even in our dysfunction. And he wants us to keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. That God never takes his eyes off of us. See, even though Peter took his eyes off of Jesus, Jesus never took his eyes off of Peter. He was there to catch him when he fell. And even when Joseph was being thrown into the pit, through Reuben, God says, let's not kill him. Now, they were about to murder him, but Reuben intervenes and says, put him in the pit instead. See, God always provides a way out, even when it isn't what we think or want it to be. And so what do we do with that? God is always present, even when he seems absent. Here's what we do. First of all, take heart. Take heart and stay focused. Stay focused on doing the right thing. Keep praying. Keep living the Christian life. Keep being the bigger person. See, we remind people of God's presence when we, like Jesus, respond to their doubt and their offenses with a hand of forgiveness, of grace, and mercy. So that's the first thing. Take heart. Stay focused. If the dysfunction is between you and someone else, if it's within your family, I want you to see what Jesus did. He helped Peter, then he corrected Peter. Connect, then correct has become a famous phrase of mine. Normally when people accuse us of things, when people try to uh, hurt us or they offend us, we want to correct the behavior right away. We want to reply in defense. I often say, when someone is shouting at you, when someone is raging at you, it's often because they don't feel understood. They don't feel heard. So if you're calling one of your children from upstairs and they don't hear you, are you going to quiet your voice or are you going to shout more? But don't let it be my parents if she's watching, right? She only wants to call twice and then there's no more talking. Well, that's, I digress. That's a different story for a different day. People shout louder. People become more enraged when they don't feel hurt. Jesus connected. And so the first thing when you are finding yourself in dysfunction with somebody is try to connect with them where they are. You don't have to agree or concur, but often people come in and I am angry. I can't stand this person. You have every right to be angry if that's how you were treated. You have every right to feel what you feel. I connect. Now let's talk about how you are discharging that because it's inappropriate. Once you are connected with somebody, you can correct their behavior. Connect, then correct. And then finally, dear friends, if we take heart and stay focused, if we learn to connect and correct, I believe there's a message for us here as the church as well. Matthew is picturing us in the boat. See, the boat has often been used as a picture of the church for centuries. That's why the church itself, the sanctuary, is called the nave, meaning ship. It's Latin for ship, right? And so the boat here is the church, and he is asking us to kind of stick together. And so we look and find support. Peter jumps out of the boat. Jesus brings him back into the boat. We can't fight dysfunction alone. We need everyone and we need support. No man 
is an island, as the saying goes. Where are you seeking support? Don't cut yourself off from the church when God seems absent. Don't move away from the person when they are angry at you. Move toward the person, even if it doesn't end as you hope it would be. And so take heart and stay focused. Connect, then correct. And of course, dear friends, seek support. When the winds are blowing against you, trust God. And if you can trust him, it makes doing these things, taking on these tasks, that much easier. Amen. Let us stand and reaffirm our faith. The words of the Nicene Creed, page 358. We believe in one God, the, the Father, Father the, the Almighty, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the, the only Son, Son of God. God eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people today are Form 4, found on page 388 of the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray for the church and for the world. Grant, Almighty God, that all who confess your name may be united in your truth, live together in your love, and reveal your glory in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Guide the people of this land and of all the nations in the ways of justice and peace, that we may honor one another and serve the common good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give us all a reverence for the earth as your own creation, that we may use its resources rightly in the service of others and to your honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Bless all whose lives are closely linked with ours and grant that may we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Comfort and heal all those who suffer in body, mind, or spirit. Give them courage and hope in their troubles, and bring them the joy of your salvation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We commend to your mercy all who have died, that your will for them may be fulfilled, and we pray that we may share with all your saints in your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord, hear the prayers of your people. What we have asked faithfully, grant that we may obtain effectually through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Together, most, most merciful, merciful God, God, 
we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you. Forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. My brothers and sisters in Christ, knowing that God is always present, let us now embrace those next to us. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. For those of you watching via Facebook, this is the part where we cleanse ourselves as a symbol of purity going before God's altar. Wash my hands in the innocence of thee, O Lord, that I may go to your altar with clean hands and a pure heart. In the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So I'm saying that in my head, even though you see me just washing my hands. Our service continues on page 361. The Holy Eucharistic Prayer. The Great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. For you are the source of light and life. You made us in your image and called us to new life in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And after supper, he took the cup of wine. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. died. Christ has risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also, that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, 
we are bold to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. My Jesus, we believe that you are present in the blessed sacrament of the altar. We love you above all things and long for you in our souls. Since there are some of us who cannot now receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into our hearts. As though you have already come, we embrace you and unite ourselves entirely to you. Never permit us to be separated from you. Amen. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Amen. Post-Communion Prayer, page 365. Together, Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve with gladness and heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Peace of God which surpasses all understanding. Keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and in the love of God. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen.